Hello everyone, it's Thursday in Paris. This is the Eiffel Tower, a bonus episode with French Today, who present the show usually, but uh, for this episode, it's just me and Camille talking about how to learn French. Now, it's a pretty interesting thought, really. Uh, we all know that you can go to a school and learn uh, all the grammar and all the tenses and all the boring stuff, if you ask me, uh, which is exactly what I did when I first moved to Paris, but I chat with Camille about lots of different things, but especially this concept of the best order in which to learn French. So you're going to hear it from her, but the idea is that you shouldn't get weighed down learning grammar and tenses and things like that. You should start with the basics. You should focus on your own things. And uh, well, look, I'm going to let her explain it to you. Uh, but a bonus episode. Uh, enjoy Kemi from French Today. And remember, you can do it while you're listening. If you visit their website this month, so March in 2019, all you need to do is put www.frenchtoday.com forward slash earful3 and you will get a further 10% off all their audiobooks. If you're listening to this in the future, April, May, June, put four, five, or six respectively at the end of that link and it will give you the 10% discount. Uh, but let's take it away here. Here's Camille from French Today talking about the order in which she thinks you should learn French. Hello, Camille. Hey, bonjour, Olivier. Ça va? Ça va très bien. Et toi? Ça va super. Merci. I still get nervous using the toi with, uh, with anybody. Yes, well. You know, <laughs> I've got a question for you before we even get uh, started. I was walking down the, the road yesterday with a friend and there was a, a, an older man than me who uh, he runs a, a restaurant. And I uh -huh. said, you know, salut, ça va? And he said, et toi, to me. Mm -hmm. And I responded, très bien, et vous, right? Mm -hmm. And the friend that I was with said, Oliver, you don't need to voo him. He just tooed you. And yep. I said, I'm not sure I'm not sure if that's 100% the way it works. So um, it's a question of, it's a tough question to answer. So yes, it does work this way. If somebody says two to you, you are supposed to, I mean, they're offering you to be able to say two to them as well, except if there is a huge difference of age, uh, meaning if uh, you are a child, say, eight years old, it's likely that you have to voo an adult, even mm. if the adult is like, say, you know, 25, 26 or something like that. Or if you're a teen, let's say that I have a 14 years old daughter right now and her friends are starting to to me and I'm like, You know, I'm kind of formal this way that, uh, um, yeah, it's starting to be okay, but it's not quite fantastic yet. <laughs> what, do you, what do you say, like, if you have a pet dog? Do you to it or do yeah. you voo it? I to it, but uh, I know some people that for fun uh, say voo to their dogs. It's, a, it's also a question of personal, <laughs> you know, preference and see That, how it sounds. That's but, crazy. I would say that in your situation with that guy, you would probably, like it was really casual, it's not that older than you. So, mm. you know, I'm talking about huge age difference, like 30 no, years old. I get old. you, I get you, yeah. I get you. What, one more question on this before we get on to today's topic uh, <laughs> is uh, often when I'm uh, toing someone, I know you don't say toing, that's my Englishification of the French language. But when, that's clear. I'm, and when I'm using the to form with someone... Uh, Often, it's very natural for me to say s'il vous plaît, even though I know I could say s'il te plaît, mm -hmm. right? Do you think that those French people that I say that to when I mix it up accidentally, do you think they care? I mean, they definitely notice, right? They, they will notice. Uh, they will hopefully forgive you also, <laughs> knowing I that it's so kind so. of, uh, <laughs> you know, like uh, it's natural to you. Uh, but yeah, you should... in. In the idea that you are trying to really, you know, better your French and so on, it's something to watch out for. And you want to glide. S'il te plaît. S'il te plaît. Yes, which is something that you talk about a lot on your audiobooks, uh, French Today, which is obviously uh, who you are. I've introduced you before. By now, I would say that the listeners of the Eiffel Tower are pretty clear with who you are, uh, Camille. Uh, <laughs> but for you guys who are new, who've never listened to an episode before, the idea is that in Camille's audiobooks, there's the version of uh, the street street French, as in speaking at the speed that people will talk to each other on the street. And uh, this brings us nicely to the topic, Camille, of today, which is the order of how you suggest people should learn French because 
Uh, a lot of teachers out there have their set order, and it's probably the way that most people listening to the show learn French if, you, if you've gone through the schooling way. And when you and I talked about it, Camille, you said, well, I'm not sure that's the best way to learn. What did you mean? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'm actually quite convinced it's not the right way to learn. Um, see, traditionally, French is still taught uh, to foreigners kind of the same way as we teach uh, French to our own children. Um, the problem is that a French kid already knows how to speak French be before they learn how to write French. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that happens to you, but uh, for a lot of my students, as soon as they started to to speak French, say, you know, chapter two in the book, it already jumps into passé composé and all the conjugation of verbs. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's wrong. <laughs> that's that's super, super overwhelming for an English speaker. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So, so you think that in French, when they're teaching French, they're basically teaching it the way that you, you need to already speak French to understand the way you're being taught. Not necessarily French, but uh, Romance language, uh, like the way... French is taught uh, in schools to Spanish students can make uh, total sense to Spanish students because the grammar and the logic is the same. So they are kind of ready, like a Spanish speaker will be totally fine with the fact that uh, every object has a gender, that everything is either feminine or masculine. A Spanish speaker would be totally fine with the fact that the end of your verb is going to change uh, according to all the different subject pronouns at all the different tenses. That's the same in Spanish. But it's not the case in English. It's not the case at all in English. And I think that when you teach a language, uh, when you teach anything really, you have to keep in mind the needs of your audience. Uh, they need to understand the logic too. And for an English speaker, uh, just doing this agreement between the je and the verb form and doing a different one for nous and doing a different one for tu, it's... Well, it's not rocket science to understand the concept, but to apply it all the time to get this, you know, reflex, it takes time and repetition. Mm. And that's and that's a big part of what you do is repetition. But let's talk away. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, the sort of order that you would recommend people to learn French in. Yeah. Because I mean, I mean, if I go back to w when I moved to France, I studied at a uh, at a school that taught French, and it was the cheapest one uh, in Paris because that was the kind of person I was back in those days. <laughs> and uh, I, th I don't know if you and I talked about this on an episode before, but like I said, maybe someone's listening for the first time, so I'll retell it. The teacher was almost uh, almost evil to me, and he would f he would he uh, they'd pick a difficult subject, for example, the subjunctive, uh, the subjunctive tense, and he'd go around the class and say, What's the answer to this? And people would say, I don't know. And I remember once he said, he said, Oliver, like, uh, what's the sub subjunctive to this? And I said, I said, je ne sais pas. And he went, oh, tu ne sais pas, Oliver. And I said, no, I re you know, like he made me feel stupid as well as while talking about something really difficult, I found. And, uh, and I'm interested in your thoughts on that and whether and why that's maybe not the best way to start out learning French. Uh, to me, what you're describing is absolutely the, the very, very worst experience. Uh, and uh, it's already terrible to experience that as a kid. But unfortunately, <laughs> that's still how many um, uh, French teacher, you know, teach uh, French to adults <laughs> mm. who are still learning French for their pleasure, for, you know, to do something that they like. And then they get yelled at or they feel stupid. And it's not because they are stupid. It's because the method they are using is not appropriate for their needs. Uh, I want my students to have fun. I want them to feel confident. I want them to enjoy the time they spend, you know, studying with my audiobook. Um, to me, each time that I explain a grammar point, it is always, always illustrated by a real story. 
um, the story is ongoing, so you you get you know close to these characters. You want to know what happens to them next. They are like your French friends, you know, yeah. and that creates a nice ambience. It's 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 really a positive thing, and. I never ever assume that uh, a student knows uh, what a verb is or what a pronoun is or what an adjective or what's the difference between an adjective and an adverb. Uh, mm. If you're not a teacher, if you're not a language teacher, you really don't need to know these things. So I explain everything. I first explain in English so the student understands what it is that we're talking about. And then... I explain the French. I explain the French logic and compare it to English, saying, watch out, it's different. Or, yay, cool, it's the same, mm. <laughs> you know. Mm, mm, and mm. then illustrate everything with exercises, the story, and then students can repeat the story and learn both, you know, the technical, the, the uh, intellectual parts of the lesson, but also learn from the context, oh, she says it this way. I can repeat that. I can say, um, I don't know, uh, je la regarde and glide it, je la regarde, you know, and then mm. apply another verb and, and work it this way. People have different ways of learning and, and it's up to the teacher to reach out to his students. It's not up to the students to adapt to the teaching. Mm. I think you make you make an interesting point about um, like when I was learning French and uh, when I've learned other languages like Swedish before, they teach you, you know, they sometimes they take it for common knowledge that the most common verbs are to be and to have, mm -hmm. right? But if and I even tested this, if you talk to people who've never learned a language besides English and you say, "Tell me the most common verbs," tell me the the most common verbs in the English language. Sometimes you'll have people say, what's what's a verb again? Is it a doing word? And then sometimes you'll have people who say, I don't know, is it to run, to jump? Like, mm -hmm. like we don't, I don't know about other countries who, people from other countries who might be listening to this show, but in Australia where I uh, learned English or, you know, like where we were, where I was schooled, um, we weren't taught language as a, you know, we just sort of picked it up. Yes, which, yes. It's very much the case with English language. And um, the thing is that English grammar is much easier than French grammar. I mean, no, it's not exactly that. Um, English sentence structure is easier. So you don't really need to know the grammar to actually build a sentence correctly. Uh, you don't need to know that this is a direct object or an indirect object or you can pick it just by repeating, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And although it is in the school curriculum, you have done at one point some grammatical structure, but most students don't care about that, like unless you want to become a teacher or, mm -hmm. you know, you're really into languages, you're probably forgotten. And you spend so little time in an English curriculum studying the logic of the grammar that most students, when they are adults, they actually don't know the difference mm -hmm. between, as I said, for example, an adjective and an adverb. And mm -hmm. it's totally fine. You can be a rocket scientist and be the most you know, intelligent person and be witty with the language and speak beautifully, but not be able to explain the difference between an adverb and an adjective in mm -hmm. English. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunately in French, it's the contrary. We spend all our studies studying the damn, you know, passé composé yeah. agreement rules and so on. All our teachers, they gang up against us. So pretty much the math teacher is going to remove points from your grade because when you wrote down your math essay, you missed up an agreement. Paf! Oh one God. point less, you know? Wow. <laughs> so... That's why it's not, you know, so many people have this idea that the French, they love their language. They're so much in love with French. But no, we don't have a choice. Like mm. during all our studies, you know, teachers just ganged up on us to really, really make sure that we had no choice but to learn those rules. 
That's it. That's intense. And I've heard French people, French adults, discussing language uh, and the finer points of whether something was incorrectly said or not. And I hear that still, and I always find that interesting because I know that it's uh, extremely seldom that something similar would happen among native English speakers. You know. You're absolutely right, and and I think it's a cultural point worth discussing, actually, uh, which which is because actually of our school education and the fact that our teacher constantly corrected us, our parents constantly correcting us. Uh, I, I still do it to Leila when Leila, again, 14 years old, speaks. If she makes a mistake on subjunctive, I will correct her and she will repeat the sentence to these days. Okay, mm. so mm. we are so accustomed to doing it that I guess that it becomes an important part of our life. It's an important marker for um, social class and education, and it's an important marker uh, for to show you wit. You know, people, French people, in higher circles, I would say, French people do mind the way you express yourself. They will look for these mistakes and they will correct you because they don't even think whether it's polite or not to correct somebody. They just, it's its like a reflex because it's been done to us so much that we hear a mistake, puff, we correct it. Mm. And I think it's awful personally. I never correct anybody who speaks French if they don't ask me to correct yeah. them. Never. Like, like I've asked you to correct me though. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't... I'm, I'm your exception. <laughs> yes, you're my exception. And speaking, uh, speaking of, though, um, I want to bring up a point very recently in Monday's episode. Uh, my pronunciation of bow tie in French was probably left a bit to be desired. <laughs> um, so now that I've got you, can you help me get it right? Yes, I can. So, so it's... Uh, um, sh should, I, should I give you my version first? Yes, go for it. Un ne papillon. Yeah, that's it. That's excellent. That was un, better. Yeah, un nœud papillon. I think the problem, un nœud papillon. I think the problem is the way I visually saw it first, rather than I heard it first. And I saw it was spelt with every. It looked like a a, a bad Scrabble hand. What was it? N. What is it? N O U E D or something? Yes, is that right? and we call it uh, un e dans l'eau, un i. E in the o because when you tr uh, when you write it you trace no it's not trace in english well i don't know you you draw your o and with the loop of the o you continue it into the e and put your e right next to the to the uh, o yeah i've seen so that it's we, a, we, yeah i've seen that They do it in maneuver as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, cool. And so that's another excellent point, Oliver, which yeah. is uh, if you want to learn French, to speak French, then learn with audio. You don't need mm. to know how to spell ne papillon. Who cares mm. how to spell ne papillon if you don't <laughs> plan on writing ne papillon? Uh, if you only plan on, on using it, then just in your head think an e if it makes it easy just yeah. but just insist on it no right. because it's you can't glide over it you know you have to pronounce this e part ne papillon but the good part is that you can shorten the papillon you can say un ne pap oh, un really? ne pap mm -hmm. wow you know um i came across a weird word the other day in french uh, when there was a guy i was lining up to use the toilets in a bar And a guy came up to me and he said, uh, he said something, he used the word shut. Do you know this? Le shut. Yeah, yeah le shut. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But yeah. <laughs> I'd never heard it before and he said it so quick. He said something along the lines of, of like, t'as ton le shut? Le shut? Yeah, and yeah, I was yeah. like, what did you, do? I had no <laughs> idea. And, and the word shut, shut is like, uh, it's like a slang word for toilets. But yeah. I'd never heard it. And then he straight away said, ah, oh, You're not French, are you? And I said, nope. And you're going to have to explain that one to me, <laughs> sir. But now I know it. Um, yeah. But that's off. And now I've gone off topic again, Camille. Um, what we've talked about a lot now is how the French people learn French and how that can be quite difficult for them and especially difficult for foreign people. But let's talk about the order that you uh, suggest people learn French and how they start and how they build up 
from 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 zero to one hundred. How yeah. does that? Um, well, there's a very precise order. I, I'm not going to go into all the details, but I in my audiobooks I really rethought the way you should approach French. You know, the what's the easiest way for an English speaker to to learn French? So it starts with politeness. There's there's no way around it. You know, politeness is the most important thing. You have to know how to say bonjour, au revoir, merci. You have to be able to introduce yourself and uh, ask the person if they're doing well. You know, so t- basis. That is pretty much covered with all the books. Uh, it's a good way also to start learning some French pronunciation. Okay. Uh, then uh, I explain but slowly, <laughs> the subject pronouns. And I go around it, meaning I not only follow the grammatical logic it's to say that I don't only explain je, but I also explain moi, because you will often see them together and students don't necessarily understand why do you say je, why do you say moi, and, and mm-hmm. things like that. Um, and then soon you will have to learn your verbs. But please start in the present tense. Okay, the present tense is the base for most conversation in everyday daily life. You're going to be speaking in the present tense. Furthermore, if you refer to a past event in the present tense, uh, but use the the good keywords like yesterday and you Mm. say hier, je vais au cinéma. Mm. Okay, there's a mistake there. Yes, the the verb is not at the correct verb. But did you understand what I say? <laughs> yeah, I certainly you did. did. You said yesterday <laughs> I'm going to the cinema. It sounds yes. a bit like when I speak French when you when you talk like that, Camille. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? It's uh, I've seen you talk French and you get by. People understand you. You can have whole conversations. And isn't that what most students want today? To be mm. able to communicate, um, communicating perfectly. And with wit and humor, it's going to have to wait. You know, Mm. you have to prioritize your Mm. French learning. Mm. And to me, uh, I think the priority would be having a decent accent, being polite, asking questions, covering everyday daily life, introducing yourself, talking about your hobby, your work, your family, this kind of things. The French subjunctive can wait. <laughs> I think that the French subjunctive subjunctive can wait forever, as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. I'm uh, I'm scarred for life from from Hugo, my former teacher. Um, but but uh, one thing that I think really I think personally works really well with your uh, method of teaching, and why I hope it works with the the listeners to this show who choose to to uh, to buy your audio books is that many people especially people listening to this show who live abroad and maybe come to Paris as tourists or want to just sort of dip their foot a bit deeper into the the French waters, is that, like you say, uh, it's better to be able to be understood and get by so that when you do come to Paris, you can have small talk and get away with it, even if you get it a bit wrong. Um, it's better It's better to learn, uh, like, like Camille, like you just said, and be able to use it than to be uh, dabbling in the subjunctive early and know that you're right, but that you can't speak it. And that's why I really like um, I really like the way that you're teaching, Camille. Well, thank you, Oliver. <laughs> it's fun. It's fun too. Um, and I like the story. And I like when I remember uh, several months ago when we were out for a stroll in Brittany, you, me, and uh, and Lena, and you were talking about how uh, what did you say how how close you've become to the the fictional characters that you invented. <laughs> yes, they, they they are very. Very much all different faces of myself, who I am, who I wished I be, who I fear to be. And, you know, there's so much me in, in all of them. And that keeps them very real. You know, when, when you read the story, uh, a lot of students tell me, not only did I learn French, but I learn about French culture, about a typical French reaction, um, what people expect, what you know, the kind of conversation they would have with their friends and so on. It's mm. the, the method is extremely gradual. Uh, it, it, it's based on a lot of... When I say repetition, it's not only do I 
encourage you to repeat out loud the same sentence, but also I mean that the next dialogue, the dialogue of chapter three, for example, is going to reuse all the words that you have you learned in chapter one and chapter two. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's extremely progressive this way. Uh, whereas a, a lot of uh, books, you know, I've seen, yes, they all say that they illustrate with, with a dialogue, but the dialogue is full of new words, of new verbs, of new tenses. It, it, it's like each time you, you, you have a new dialogue, it's seventy percent new material. Mm. <laughs> it's awful. You 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 feel like each time you hit a new dialogue, it's like you're hitting a wall. You know, yeah, right? <laughs> Which is not going to be the case with my method at all. It's it's smooth. You know, it's mm. really I want to build your self confidence. That's my mm. my my aim. <laughs> and I, I like it. Speaking of uh, uh, audiobook three, which is what I'm up to at the moment, um, there was a bit that I just saw this morning about. Uh, you you mentioned having a, a rendezvous or a date, and then mm-hmm. you sort of said, "Well, you know, you don't really date in Paris." And it's exactly what you said: like you're giving people an insight into um, into French life, uh, absolutely, a, as well as telling them how to talk about, it, which is great. Um, but as time is absolutely flying away, as it always does when we <laughs> chat, Camille, I thought we could end on something. Um, maybe you can give a tip to someone who's at about level three in your books of uh, of uh, a way to improve their French that they hadn't thought about? Um, I would say uh, uh, at level three, you already have a pretty good knowledge of French. Um, the danger there is actually to not work enough. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm really sorry, but uh, I don't have a magic wand for you. Okay, if you are going to improve your French, you need to work at it. You need to do drills. You need to repeat. You you can understand. Yeah, yeah. the French brain is weird this way because you can understand a concept, but yet you can't really apply it. You right. you need to train. You you can know how to run perfectly. You can have seen many videos of people running and bought the best running shoes and you know you you know everything all the technicalities about running but if you don't start running if you don't start by mm. you know practicing regularly you're never going to be able to run a marathon mm. so and also some of us will never be able to run marathons <laughs> you know yep, yep, so yep, yep. you you also have to set realistic expectations for yourself. Uh, People who study French, you know, one hour per week, they're going to progress. But are they going to get bilingual within a couple of of, uh, months or years? Uh, No, I don't think so. So, Mm. yeah, it all starts with fixing realistic goals for yourself, finding the right method for you. My method Mm. is not right for everybody. People who want to learn how to spell French, for example, for example, or that are really, you know, nitpicking about being extremely precise about the language, never making mistakes. No, don't don't learn with my method. My mm. my method is going to teach you to be efficient, to communicate, to understand the language and it's okay if you make mistake but then first you know communicate first always always communicate first and then smooth the edges you know <laughs> it's um it's it's astonishing that that's the tip that you gave because we didn't talk about this in advance but uh it's the perfect segue into the next bonus episode that you and I are going to do about uh the whole idea of motivation and learning french and and the time to put into it uh, so I'm glad you said that, actually. Okay. I think, that's, I think that's our next conversation. <laughs> Secondly, it also felt that maybe you were speaking directly to me because uh, I think you know me well, Camille, now. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know that I struggle to, to uh, you know, uh, sit down on... I, my thing is I love the magic wand and I believe it exists out there. <laughs> uh, the, the old baguette magic. Is that what it's called? Yes, baguette magic. Une, une baguette une magic. Yeah. baguette magic, the magic uh, baguette. Um, but <laughs> together we're going to do this and I'm looking forward to continuing uh, uh, working on your method so thank you so much for uh, for teaching me thank you very much Oliver it's always a pleasure to see you and I'll be looking forward to the next time we talk ok, uh, à la prochaine à la prochaine
So there you go. That was Camille. If you uh, enjoyed listening to that episode, well, like I said at the very start, frenchtoday.com forward slash earful3, you get a further 10% off. And uh, hopefully you'll be learning French along with me. A little bit of a a side note now, you know, for for the whole year at the end of the episode, I've been talking about French today. So now I've been talking about French today for the whole episode, I guess I can talk about something else. And uh, what I thought I'd uh, talk about is uh, the first Earful Tower Patreon meetup, which is going to, it's a pretty good event, if I do say so myself. It's going to be on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, 26th of March. It's for the book club. And we're going to have, I think, 12 people in the author John Baxter's apartment on the left bank, talking about his newest book, A Year in Paris, and also uh, pouring over his collection of uh, first edition books by Hemingway and much, much more. So the reason I bring it up is because, firstly, I'm really excited to have Patreon supporters of this show in one room in Paris for the first time ever. I've never done that before. I'm really excited about that. But the other reason I bring it up is to remind you of the book club, which is uh, well, it's free to join. It's for the, for the moment, it's only on Facebook. And uh, it's called the Eiffel Tower Book Club. Go and check it out. Next month's book is going to be Paris to the Moon by Adam Gopnik. So that will be uh, the April book. So I hope to see you guys there. For you other Patreon supporters, you may have seen this week I did, well, yesterday, I did a walk with Karen Olson from Paris in four months. We walked all around the Ile Saint-Louis looking for the pig that she mentioned in her episode of the Eiffel Tower a little while back. Didn't find the pig, but found loads of interesting stuff. And I put a blog piece up about the mysterious cow island that you've probably never heard about before. I encourage you to go and check it out. And you know, funny thing, I put a picture of it on Instagram. The mayor of the Marais commented. He said, if you want to know about things like cow island, Oliver, you know who to ask. So maybe the mayor has some untold secrets I should uh, investigate. Could be something for a future episode. I'll leave you guys on that thought. Happy French learning. And I'll talk to you on Monday. As always, thanks for listening. I don't really know where we are I just